as a consultant, whenever I visit a customer or whenever one of my colleagues visit a customer, people talk about GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. And they talk about it with a little bit of fear in their voices. So today I'm hoping to uh, get rid of some of that fear and show you how to build your stuff with privacy by design so that everybody will be happy. My name is Johannes Brodwell. I work for a consultancy in Norway, Soprasteria, and um, uh, we have uh, uh, many uh, good customers and stuff, and we hire. So uh, if you're interested in a job, let me know. Uh, when we, we visit our customer, uh, everybody today has a GDPR strategy, and uh, probably the most common GDPR strategy is uh, to have long meetings, uh, write big documents, uh, write long lists of tasks that somebody uh, wants to do, and hope that somebody does those tasks. And I think that pretty much is the uh, most uh, adopted strategy for dealing with the GDPR. Uh, another very common strategy for dealing with the GDPR is to express a bit of concern with the ramification while you're not actually sure what to do about it. So uh, we will um, uh, uh, try and get over these strategies and do something better. So as um, uh, pretty much everybody here, including myself, is a programmer, and um, the first thing I will cover is why should uh, we as programmers care about uh, GDPR. The second thing I will talk about is why should we as human beings, and I see that most of you guys in the audience are humans as well, so that's, that's also relevant to you, why should everybody care about uh, privacy? And the third uh, part of the talk, I will help you read the GDPR. As, as we uh, looked at before the talk, uh, actually reading the text is a little bit hard. So I will start with uh, a story from uh, the conferences uh, that I, uh, conference that I organized. In addition to being a consultant, I, uh, I uh, lead a conference called uh, Mobile Era. We ha had our um, yearly conference two weeks ago uh, in Oslo. And uh, to celebrate uh, the completion of our conference, we wanted all of the crew to come to dinner, right? So we send out a invitation form where I can say if there's anything uh, that I cannot eat or drink, and uh, uh, then we can find out who's coming and what we're going to order. Uh, and um, uh, people put in uh, their preferences. But wait a minute. Some of the data that we collect in this form is personal data. My friend Ola here, he's a vegetarian. Is that personal data? So the GDPR applies to all uh, processing of personal data by automated means. And personal data is any data that is related to an identifiable person. So the fact that Ula is a vegetarian is personal data. OK. Uh, now, not all information is created the same. Uh, Ali says that he doesn't eat pork. What do you guys think you know about Ali now? He's a Muslim. And uh, processing of data about people's religious beliefs is a special category of personal data, which requires additional concern when you're processing data. There are more kinds of special categories of personal data that you can end up collecting. Medical information is a special category of personal data. The fact that Kari is allergic to shellfish is a special category of personal data. OK, so we have personal data. We have data about people's, personal, about people's religious belief. And now what do we do? The first advice, and this is the most important advice that I will give you about GDPR, is read Article 5 of the GDPR. I will show a lot of slides with screenshots of the text from GDPR. Um, you're not expected to read those uh, slides, but it is to relate what I'm saying to the actual law that is, um, uh, that is in the GDPR. So you don't actually have to read this, but uh, it's interesting to know that it exists. Uh, and Article 5 gives sort of the overview of what uh, you're required to do if you're processing personal data. First, the processing has to be lawful. You have to have a legal reason for using it. It has to be used for a specific purpose. Uh, 
uh, and only be used for that specific purpose. You have to collect no more data than what's necessary uh, for that purpose. You have to make sure that the data is correct, accurate. Uh, you have to delete the data when you no longer need it. And you have to take steps to keep the data secure. This is not unreasonable stuff, but it's a list of things we have to do. Uh, secondly, you have to give uh, the data subject, that is, the person that you're collecting data about, you have to let them know that you're collecting data about them. And you have to let them know how to exercise their rights to that data. Because data about you is your data, so you have rights to that data. Uh, and your uh, information to the people that uh, you're collecting data about has to be transparent, available, uh, it has to be possible to read. If you're, if you're targeting children in particular, it has to be possible to understand for children of the age group that you're targeting. So that can be kind of challenging, and it has to be concise. So it has to be complete and concise. That's always nice. Then you have to think about, if you're transporting this data outside of EU, now Google is doesn't necessarily tell you where it stores the data. So I use Google Forms to collect this data. But does uh, Google store this in the EU? And is it OK that they don't store it in the EU? So we have some concerns. In short, we don't quite know what to do. So let's take a deep breath. And now the mic is going to act up, I think. And let's see if we can fix this. First, we need to know the legal basis for our processing. What's the reason that we're allowed to process this? There are six reasons, and uh, they're basically either because the user lets us, that is, consent, uh, or because we're required to, by contract, by law, or to protect some uh, person's vital interest. In our case, um, we want to use the consent of the user, so, which means that we want to ask the user for permission to use their data. And consent is uh, the best kind of uh, lawfulness of processing because it keeps the user in control. So it is when you can use consent, it is better for the user. So we want to do that. I showed you uh, the requirements for the information we give to the user. Now, what's nice is that right after Article 12, which states these requirements, is Article 13. And Article 13 says, exactly what do you need to tell the user? You need to tell them. Uh, who are you that collects the data? Uh, why are you collecting the data? Who's going to get access to the data? How long will you keep the data? And you have to key, uh, tell the user how they can exercise their right to see the data and delete the data. So in the case of our dinner uh, form, we add a text to say something like, uh, uh, we used information to place the order. Uh, the information will only be accessed by the party committee. And the information will be deleted after we place the order. We also add a consent checkbox to this uh, form just to let people uh, express that, uh, yes, they agree that we collect this data. Uh, now, I'm not a lawyer. And don't use my text as legal advice. If, if you're going to use a, a, if you're going to give a privacy statement, you probably want to uh, here with someone who's professional about that. So uh, by giving a little bit more information to the user, we have solved uh, both the problem of uh, lawful processing and the problem of uh, what information to give to the user. Now, this question of transferring to the outside of the EU. So in general, transferring data outside the EU should not happen unless there is a reason you can do it. One such reason is if the country that you're transferring it to has adequate uh, protections for people's privacy. And it's actually stated in Article uh, 45 uh, that this includes uh, respect for the rule of law, for human rights, and privacy regulations in that country. That, in my opinion, pretty much rules out the United States, who are a rogue nation when it comes to privacy. It also rules out China. So we cannot use this basis for processing. However, uh, a company, a processor, which is Google's role in this, can also provide adequate um, safeguards to make sure that they're protecting the data correctly. Uh, and Google is using what's called binding corporate rules, which means that they say 
They're going to only process the data as instructed by uh, the controller of the data, so that would be me as the owner of this form. They're going to uh, respect the privacy laws of the EU European Union, and they are going to cooperate with the author uh, authorities in the relevant countries. Uh, so uh, now, of course, you can ask, have, do you think that a company like Google or Microsoft or Amazon has thought about this? Do you think that they're concerned about this? Of course they are. So in the, term, in, uh, uh, the example of Google that we're using here, they have uh, very good information about how they are uh, respecting uh, the GDPR. In particular, they have uh, uh, the description of their data protection of their data processing agreement, which tells uh, you that they will only process the data as instructed by you, and they will cooperate with the authorities in terms of privacy. So that wasn't so bad, was it? So now we know why we're allowed to process the data. We've given the user sufficient information, and we've thought about why are we storing this on Google servers. There's one more thing that you want to be concerned about, which is data protection by the sign and default, which is to say, um, you're actually required by law to have good uh, guidelines or follow good guidelines for how you're processing personal data. Um, I was introduced to those guidelines when I uh, actually helped out the Norwegian Data Protection Authority with writing some new guidelines on this. So these things are pretty updated. And one example of such guideline would be instead of... Uh, so the, the example that's often used is that, let's say you're making a doctor's appointment. Instead of having a, uh, a text field where you can put in what, is your, what do you need, uh, you can have a drop-down list. Because with a drop-down list, you don't accidentally put in personal information that you didn't intend to put in. And in the case of our um, dinner, we can replace uh, the dietary restriction with the menu. And the advantage of this is that then everybody gets really excited about the dinner because this is a really good menu. And also on the menu, uh, we have a really good uh, smoked bean burger, which is a vegetarian option. And this burger is actually one of my favorite dishes. So even though I'm not a vegetarian, and even though I'm not a Muslim, I might uh, choose this uh, non-pork vegetarian option. So the fact that I choose this option doesn't tell you anything about me. So this is actually a serious point. This is a kind of a silly example, right? This is like my little conference. We're sending out a, 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 a form to get people's dinner reservations. But the GDPR actually applies to this sort of situation. It applies to voluntary work. It applies to uh, uh, non-profit organizations. Uh, and of course, it applies to uh, bigger corporations. So that means that if you're running a sports club, or if you're running a Boy Scout group, or if you're uh, organizing a conference on your spare time, you still have to think about the privacy uh, regulation and, and about uh, GDPR. This sounds like a lot of work and hassle. Why do we have to deal with this? So the question is, why can't we just swipe left on privacy, right? Do we need privacy? I will go through two important reasons why privacy matters. The first one is um, kind of just plain business, which is that when we have uniform uh, laws, it makes for better trade. So one of the goals of the GDPR, which is stated in the recitals, which are the, uh, the articles before the articles, the, 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 st the stuff that you started reading. So it's stated that we want the European economies to converge so that things are more similar. It makes it easier to create solutions for all of Europe if those solutions follow the same rules. So that's a good thing. Um, and this removes the obstacles to uh, transporting uh, personal data inside of the EU and inside of the region that, that protects people's privacy. This is actually a a point that has an effect. Uh, ThoughtWorks, in their technology radar, I think starting 2015, uh, recognizes that the European Union has the most progressive privacy laws. And because of that, it's smart to put your data on uh, data centers in the EU. That's a good thing for us Europeans. That 
it's um, easier for you to put all the data in EU on, on EU data centers rather than putting some in China or the United States. So if you're running a data center, that's good for you. <laughs> but I think the mo more important reason is that data protection is a human right. Um, and currently, it is not being respected. So there is actually a real need to change when you see what kind of consequences lack of data protection can have. GDPR does lead uh, companies to change, and so it was very, uh, a very positive news, uh, news at the beginning of the year uh, when Facebook announces that they will have a new a privacy hub as a result of the GDPR. So that means that they're actually trying to make better products for the users because of the GDPR. So that's a very good thing that Facebook did. And then it was later overshadowed by rather bad things that Facebook did, which we will get back to. There are other companies that do bad things also, to not be negative towards Facebook. One of the largest scandals in uh, last year was uh, a company called Equifax, they had a data breach that exposed uh, the social security numbers and credit rating information of about 100 million Americans. That's a lot of sensitive data that's being uh, made available to those that shouldn't have it. Another company that had a uh, similar scandal that, but was uh, closer to home because it also affected European users was Uber, who leaked, I think, 20 million, or who exposed uh, the personal data for 20 million drivers and riders, which probably includes things like where have you, drive, where have you gone on a um, Uber, and your patterns of movements can be pretty sensitive if if, you, if, the, if you're concerned about them, you, you, they can be pretty sensitive. Now, the big problem with Uber in this case is that they kept this a secret. They knew about it for close to a year, and they kept it a secret. The idea behind uh, GDPR, it's not that we expect people to do privacy perfectly. It's more like in accounting. If, you're, if you ever come into an accounting system or an organization, no organization has a perfect account. No organization has done everything correct when it comes to accounting. The question is not whether you've done everything correct. The, the question is, have you, do you have any material uh, problems? Do you have any serious problems? Are those problems because of accident or are they because you're trying to do bad stuff? And are you trying to keep it secret? So that's what we want to go after. And in terms of accounting, when you're not uh, applying, when you're not doing accounting right, then a company like Enron goes from being a leader in their field to being a show on Broadway that talks about how bad they were doing. And when it comes to companies that really violate people's personal information, we want them to go out of business and end up as a Broadway show. If they're doing it in a major way, if they're doing it in bad faith, and if they're keeping it secret. So let's talk a little bit about Facebook. Um, the Cambridge Analytica scandal, most people have heard of this scandal, uh, but I think it's useful to go through exactly what happened, at, at least as I understand it. So Facebook um, normally keeps your data fairly private, but they give uh, special applications, some special permissions. One such application was uh, called uh, This Is Your Digital Life, developed by a researcher, Alexander Kogan, in Cambridge. That's where the Cambridge name came from. And this uh, um, app got the permission to harvest not only the data of the users uh, who used the site, but also the friends of the users that used the site. So about 100,000 people gave their consent to This Is Your Digital Life to share their personal data and the personal data of their friends. The result is that um, Alexander Kogan collected uh, data about about 100 million Facebook users. This is data about what you like, where you live, who your friends are. Uh, these are your pictures. And this information uh, was... Uh, a, so Alexander Kogan then shared this with the company, Cambridge Analytica, which is a political uh, consultancy. And they used this information to micro-target voters in the Brexit election and in the presidential election of 2016. 
The way that that works is that they can see you live in a swing district in terms of the United States presidential election, a, a place where your vote matters the most, and you have a psychological profile that we can determine from what you like and what you share. So we give you an ad which is targeted at your email address, because they know the email address. They can target it directly at you that pushes you to vote in the way that they want, because you live in a particular place. And it's believed that that um, information and that capability influenced the rather disastrous elections of Brexit and the United States presidential election. So, so we've got Facebook to thank for this mess that we're in right now. Privacy does have real consequences. In the, United, in the European Union, uh, we're trying to protect people's privacy. There are other philosophies as well. So in China, there is a system that they call uh, the social credit system. Let's see if I can get it up here. It's a little bit, there we go. Dear passengers, people who travel without a ticket or behave disorderly or smoke in public areas will be punished according to regulations and the behavior will be recorded in the individual credit information system. To avoid any negative record of personal credit, please follow the relevant regulations and help with the orders on the train and at the station. Well, this is an actual recording. It kind of feels a little bit like a a cyberpunk movie, right? So what China is trying to do is that they're collecting information about who uh, rides the train without a ticket, who walks on a red light on a, a pedestrian crosswalk, who spits on the streets, who litters on the streets, who doesn't give their seat to a pregnant woman when, when she comes on the bus. And we all agree that we would like people not to litter, we would like people not to, um, uh, to, to uh, ride the subway without a ticket. But then they collect this information, and if you're deemed to have a low social credit, you will be restricted in terms of what jobs you can have, what housing you can get, what you, how you can travel. This is a very different view of the future than I think, than I hope all of us subscribe to. Has anyone uh, uh, seen that word before? Yeah. So what, uh, what, what, how do you pronounce it? <laughs> so, Uyghur is a Muslim population in China, and uh, the Chinese government is using artificial intelligence and using personal data to keep the Mus their Muslim population in check. This is why it's important to protect people's religious uh, beliefs. I don't, I don't think and I don't hope China will go there, but it can go really, really wrong. We've been down this path before, and I don't, I don't think China's going to be there, but they might get there. Does anyone know what this is? So what's that? Those are called concentration camp numbers. For those that didn't see, uh, get it the first time, this is concentration camp numbers. This is the um, schema that was used to sign these numbers. This is a primary key. This is a primary key to this, um, this card. This is a punch card. Uh, this is um, the Deutsche Hollerith um, Maschine Gemeinschaft tab Tabulator D11 machine, which was used to process these punch cards. What happened during World War II could not have happened without information processing. It could not have happened without the use of automated processing of personal data. This is why it's important. So what will we look back upon in 40 years from now? The company that owned the DHMAG company is still in business today. What companies that we work for today will have taken part of things that we will look back at with horror in 40 years. This is our responsibility as a society, and this is our responsibility as an industry. Personal data does matter. All right, 
So <laughs> I think I need a little bit of a breathe, breathing now. This is uh, heavy stuff. I'm, I, I'm sorry that I'm laying this sort of heavy stuff on you. <laughs> So let's get back to the light, lighter stuff, the general data protection regulation. All right. So now that we've uh, started with that, now we can go and look at uh, uh, all of this easy stuff of uh, how to actually protect the data. So what does the general data protection regulation mean? What is a regulation in, in this sense? Um, regulation in this term is, uh, uh, in the European Union, it means a law that applies equally to all member countries in the EU. So that means that uh, the rules in this uh, regulation applies to all of uh, EU members. Um, there aren't that many examples of regulation that have uh, been passed in the EU. This is a page on Wikipedia that lists, uh, I think, about 40 regulations, and most of them are pretty narrow. But I think we like some of them as well. Uh, so you, you guys, uh, so I'm actually controlling the slides from here. That's why I have this. Now, I'm from Norway, uh, and, but I can use this phone uh, with the same rates in, in uh, Lithuania. Uh, Rome like home. All of the telecoms were uh, so proud of how customer friendly they were. That was actually EU regulation. <laughs> so it was an EU regulation. Uh, the roaming regulation is listed for some reason under 0 to, to 9 as a uh, uh, European Union <laughs> roaming regulation, which required that uh, in all of the EU you should get the same roaming rates. So it's a good uh, thing. That, so, so the regulations can actually do things that we're happy about. So that's good. So let's get started reading the general data protection regulation or as it is known, the regulation of the European Parliament and the Council on the protection of natural persons with regard to the processing of personal data and the free movement of such data repealing directive. Oh, okay, this is, this is gonna be a little bit tough. So um, the official text of the GDPR is a PDF that I here got from the uh, European Union website. Um, the font is not ideal. Uh, the structure is not ideal for uh, human consumption. Uh, and it starts with 173 recitals. And these recitals, you actually saw some of them. They give the background for the law. They're not actually the law, but if you start reading the PDF, that's where you start reading. They're actually quite well written, but they're really hard to read. So it's not such an easy introduction. Um, so you keep going like this for a while. And uh, this PDF, it does have a table of content, but that table of content is not clickable and it's not e easily available and so on. So something, uh, something needs to be done, and luckily someone has done something. Uh, the screenshots that you've seen through most of the talk is from a site called uh, gdprinfo.eu. I, I really like this site, and what it does is that it gives you a nice table of content um, on the left here. Uh, which is clickable, and it makes all of the hyperlinks clickable. Uh, so it actually makes it easy to read the regulation. It's the same text as in the PDF, it's just organized more friendly. Uh, there is also things like an um, app. This is the um, uh, Explore GDPR app, which uh, has the translation of um, uh, the GDPR into about 20 languages, I think. So if you want to look at your local language text, this app is, is really good for that. And it's also hyperlinked, and it also works offline. So it's good for when you're uh, traveling <laughs> if you want to read something. So uh, the recitals, the beginning of the GDPR, is pretty hard to read. Um, but the articles, they're not so har uh, hard to read. They're organized into 11 chapters. Um, you can see here on the left, I've highlighted those that are probably most interesting to us. Um, and we will cover the the chapter saying the principles of uh, processing personal data, the rights of the data subject, that is the person that you're processing the data for, and your responsibilities when you're processing personal data. Those are the most interesting for developers to know about. But before we do that, uh, let's indulge in, uh, can I say, regulation porn? So the thing that makes people really excited about GDPR is Article 83. Uh, which states, if you're violating the, the GDPR, you can be fined up to 4% of your global annual revenue. For a company like 
uh, Facebook. That is a lot of money. And this is probably why people are sitting up and paying attention. The point is not uh, the fines. The point is that we want privacy to be built in. But the fines help people pay attention to it. That's why people uh, like to talk about it. But that's a little bit of a distraction. So let's get back to the essentials. The principles talk about um, why, uh, so what do you need in order to legally process personal data. Uh, the rights of the data subject tells you what you need to do in order to protect the people that you're registering data about. Um, the, uh, this is uh, article 12 through 22, so there's uh, 11 of those articles, actually 12, because it's 23. Um, and those are pretty much things you can just add to your product backlog. So there's functionality or routines you need to just put, make available when you have a system. So it's pretty easy. It's a requirement specification. We've dealt with those before. Uh, and uh, your, um, uh, your, uh, the principle for processing, the, uh, your uh, requirements as a data processor, that's pretty much like your non-functional requirements. How do you need to manage the data and keep it secure? So those are the three areas. So in short, um, let's uh, review. The, Overview of GDPR is Article 5. So it's on the left there. The principle regarding pro processing of personal data. You have to process it lawfully. You have to uh, do it for a specified purpose. Uh, you have to only collect data uh, that's needed for that purpose. You have to make sure the data is updated, uh, that uh, you delete it when you no longer need it, and that it's kept secure. Those are, that's pretty much what you need to do. That's not so hard. This is things that we could, can think about, right? So three things. Establish the lawfulness of the processing. Why are we allowed to process it? Um, facilitate the rights of the, the data subject, making sure people can control their own data, and processing the data responsibly. That's, that's our main concern when we're developing systems with privacy by design. We looked a little bit about, uh, at uh, Article 6, which comes after Article 5. And Article 6 uh, says there are six, uh, um, six reasons that you can use to process personal data. You can get people's consent to process their data. It can be required to deliver a contract that, you're, that they've entered into. It can be um, required to comply with law, a national or EU law. It can be uh, because it's a vital interest of humans. Somebody can die if you don't process this data. It can be uh, because it's uh, a sort of a national interest, or it can be because you really feel like you have to. It's actually th this last one here, um, our, uh, point F, it says the legitimate interest of the controllers. It's like, yeah, we really, really feel like we have to do it. Uh, there are some limitations to, to how you're using that, so you don't want to do that. The most interesting uh, version is that of consent. Uh, it says over here, Article 7 describes consent. So when you have all of these, yes, I agree buttons, you, the law actually states what is needed for that to be legally obtained. So first, it has to be understandable. So the long text where like, I agree to this, I agree to that, they can take my kidney, they can take my firstborn child, all of those. That's not actually legally valid. That's not a legally obtained consent. It has to be um, uh, understandable. The um, uh, data subject has to be able to withdraw their consent. So you can say, yes, I agree today, but I don't agree tomorrow. So if you're getting data by consent, you have to think about what happens when somebody no longer allows you to use their data. Um, and one of the things that is really cool is uh, it, this that I highlighted. It's really hard to read, so I'll explain it with an example. So uh, Christmas is coming, right? So Santa Claus is making a list, he's checking it twice, he's finding out it's not uh, or nice. Now, I think the Santa Claus is in violation of this term here because he's giving out presents. But he's saying that he's not giving you a present unless you uh, consent to him uh, getting your naughtiness data. 
And those are unrelated services. He doesn't need your naughtiness data to give you your present. So he probably does not have a legally obtained consent to, um, to get your personal data. Um, I, I've asked uh, a few lawyers about whether this is the correct interpretation. I'm still waiting for an answer. So that's a little bit about uh, consent. Now, uh, the rights of the data subject. So when you collect people's personal data, you have to uh, give them certain uh, rights. And um, uh, I will actually jump a little bit uh, uh, through this. We looked a little bit here about you have to tell them um, who's getting the data, why they're getting the data, uh, and uh, who's going to get the data, and uh, uh, that uh, they can exercise their rights. So you have to tell them that you get the data. What is interesting, this is easy when you're collecting data from your user. But often you're collecting data not directly from your user, but your user might put in data about other people. So it might be that you got the data from someone other than the data subject. You still have to give them the information about uh, that you have their personal data. And so that's actually a pretty, that can be pretty tough for a lot of uh, business models and a lot of uh, data models. So if you have, uh, let's say you have a, um, a frequent flyer program, and in that frequent flyer program, I can put in my family's information. So I can put in, yeah, I'm traveling, and here's the birth date of my wife who's traveling with me, and uh, my, my parents-in-law who's also traveling with me. Now I've collected personal data, so, so I, can, I can obtain the consent from me to get that personal data, but you actually have to inform my wife and my uh, parents-in-law that we collected their personal data as well. This is a little bit of a pickle, so you have to think about that one. So if you get data from someone, uh, about someone from someone else, you have to tell the person that the data is about. Um, here, Article 15 says, right to access by the data subject. If uh, I store data about you, you have the right to know what I'm storing about you. This has been the case in the, uh, in the old data protection directive for a while, but what's pretty cool about it is that you now also have the right to data portability which means that I can go to someone who stores data about me, and I say, I want this data on a uh, structured, commonly used, machine-readable format. Thank you. So that means something like, you have to be able to do a export with JSON, XML, CSV, something that the machine can reasonably read again. So that's functionality we have to develop. And it's, it's kind of cool functionality to develop. It kind of gets you started with thinking. One of the things that it gets you started with thinking is that, well, we have to be able to export our data, but we can also encourage our users to go to our competitors and export the data from there. And we can say, hey, if you upload the data from, uh, about how you're purchasing stuff from our competitor, we will give you bonus points, and you will still be in control of that data. So if you want to, be, if you want to steal customers from your um, uh, competitor, it's easier, because those customers can bring their data with them. And if you want to harass, harass your competitors with lots of requests for, for information that they might need to uh, do a lot of work to get, then you can actually do that as well. And this is actually good for everybody, because this means that people are actually forced to open systems so we can interconnect them. This is something we want, right? I think. Yes. More job, more job for us, and also more, more opportunities. Because when you can interconnect the systems, you can do more cool stuff, right? So my dream, and I've not gotten around it, is to have my milk consumption curve. So I'll go to all of the, uh, the um, grocery stores in Norway, which has these loyalty programs, right? So they probably collect what I eat, what I buy from them anyway. And then if I get the data from all of them, and I put it into my own database, and I make a graph of how much milk <laughs> we're using from week to week, that would be a really cool thing to do. And that's the kind of app that you actually can make now. And you can actually force the people who have the data to give you or to give the data subject that data if they want to use your app with it. So that's pretty cool. I'm going to skip this one because it's kind of boring. This is a, a very important one. So 
Uh, people, so when people see information that you store about them, they might see, oh, that's not my birthday. That's not my address anymore. I need that uh, rectified, corrected. They have the right to get it rectified. They can also demand that you delete the data about them if that data was obtained by consent. So you can say, I no longer want you to have this data about me. What's interesting is that when someone, when someone demands to rectify or erase personal data, you have to notify others. So that means that, let's say you exported the data from, for a personal person to a partner company. Now you have to make sure that they update their records as well. Let's say you have the data in your backups. You have to make sure that the backups are up to date as well. If you have data in your logs, you might need to de delete your logs. So, the, the, so uh, your data spreads everywhere, and you have to have that under control. Which brings us to the last area, which is your responsibility as a data processor. We've talked a little bit about data protection by the sign and default. This is, you have to collect as little data as possible to do your job, share it with as few people as possible, and keep it for as short as possible. This is your, uh, this is your obligation when you're processing personal data. You, uh, as a uh, enterprise architect, this is, this is cool if somebody works with architecture, you actually need your company to have a record of all the places you're processing personal data. You need to know what sort of data you're processing, why you're processing it, who's getting access to it, and how it's protected. So that's, that's a job for an architect, to get all of those, uh, that data into place. You ha if you're a security champion, you can go to your teams and your friends and say, we actually now need to fix that unencrypted communication between our servers, because it's, it's not secure processing. We need to update those weak database passwords. We need to replace that social security number primary key with a synthetic primary key, because it's not personal data. And, and by the way, that primary key should not be a sequence. It should be something like a UUID, because otherwise you can guess it. So as a, as a security champion, you can uh, use the GDPR to help people understand the, the importance of security. Because if you're not securing your data pro, uh, sufficiently, your company is a p possibly in violation of the GDPR. You can be fined up to 4% of their global annual <laughs> revenue, which is a lot of money. So, so do that. Um, if you work in ops, um, or you're related to ops, you actually have to notify uh, data protection authorities if there is a data breach, and you have to notify them within 72 hours. 72 hours to notify someone that, that there was an incident. So you, you have to have measures to detect that something happened, and you have to decide how to report it. Uh, 72 hours, that's plenty of time if you know what you're doing, if you have your routines in place. But if you haven't thought of it, and then something happens, now you've got 72 hours, that's not the situation you want to be in. So if you're working in ops, make sure that you have updated routines. What should we do if we did our, how should we detect a data breach? And what should we do if we detect a data breach? That gives us a little bit of a summary. So you need to get uh, a legal basis for processing personal data. You need to, you probably want to get people's consent because that gives them the most freedom. Uh, but that consent has to be freely given, understandable, and revocable. They have to be able to say, I no longer consent. Uh, the subject, the person that the data is about, has to be informed. And they have to, you have to facilitate their uh, request to uh, exercise their uh, rights. And that's also if you collected the data from someone other than the subject. So if someone puts in data about someone else, you have to inform the person that the data is about. You have to have security measures. You have to minimize the data. You have to think about what to do in case of a data breach. And you have to keep a record of all your processing of personal data. That's, that's I think, the most important things you need to do as a developer or architect in order to have a personal system. In short, if you use the data as you think your users want and you think they expect, you're probably going to be fine. If your users come to me and say, you're doing what with my data? You're probably also in violation of the, the rules. 
And it's important to remember, as long as we've done processing of personal data with machines, people have gotten hurt. So this stuff matters. With Article 83, it actually hurts for companies to violate privacy regulations, so people pay attention. And because the regulation is uniform across of the European Union, uh, it means we have the potential to adopt best practices, to adopt products that help us, that, to adopt common uh, ways of uh, expressing consents and expressing how you're doing this. So this is a good basis for building as a field and building uh, products. I hope every developer uh, goes and look at GDPR Article 5. So you can go to gdprinfo.eu, just read Article 5. It's a very good uh, overview of what you need to know, and it gives you an introduction there. So actually, I would rather that you went and read Article 5 than listen to my talk. The uh, GDPR uh, affects most of our applications. Privacy. Uh, concerns all of us. If you know how to read them, reading the regulations is pretty easy. But if you don't know how, it's pretty difficult. So it can, it can give you an edge on your colleagues if you know how to read it. Uh, thank you for paying attention. I'd love to get your comments and feedback. And I'd love for you to uh, reach me on Twitter at twitter.com slash Johannes, Johannes without the NO. My name is Johannes Broadwell. Thank you for listening to my talk.